Maldives. A beautiful place on the planet Earth and a beautiful place in my heart. It is sadly threatened by global warming and ocean acidification. Today guys, we are going to be interviewing Miss Kate Sheridan from a team which is trying to fight and protect these beautiful biodiversity and marine life. To try to fight against global warming, ocean acidification, and what is that? Well today, in this video, we are going to be learning about that by interviewing Miss Kate Sheridan. So let's get right into it guys. how we do the attachment and then we can, the three of us, build it together. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So I just need to get more? Yeah, exactly. You've got a D41. Perfect. Perfect. Nice. Nice. So here we have the woman herself, Miss Kate. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll just be asking a few questions to know more about you, and then we'll get to the more specific questions of well, Miss Kate's um, core preservation program. I can see. Yeah. yeah. On your thing exactly. Got yeah. the branding here. <laughs> right. So what inspired you to get into core preservation? I always loved wildlife growing up. Um, when I was younger, I just really wanted to work with animals. I actually wanted to be a vet, but I wasn't very good at chemistry at school, so that wasn't an option for me. And as I grew up, I learned more about conservation as a job and as a potential career. So I ended up studying geography at university and then doing a master's in conservation biology. And I learned to scuba dive during this time and I got really interested in marine life and coral reefs are facing a variety of threats, which I'm sure we'll talk more about as the video goes on. Right, so you were like starting with chemistry. I mean, no, you weren't good at chemistry. No, I was not good at chemistry, but, uh, but, you, but then you just found another passion and you yeah. continued to that. Exactly, I kind of reshifted from working. I, I kind of thought the only way to work with animals was to be a vet, but it's not at all. There are so many other jobs. And as I learned about that, I sort of shifted more being in conservation and preservation of ecosystems. And coral reefs are so endangered that I really wanted to work with this ecosystem. And how were you able to get this opportunity? Because as we know, <laughs> at the time, you were thinking that it was the only way. But now that you discovered, and now that you went and uh, went to continue the passion yeah. for um, being an animal, yeah. how did you actually arrive at this point? How did I get to the Maldives? Yeah. Wow. Um, a lot of luck, I think. <laughs> I, After my master's finished, I was sort of looking for jobs and then the COVID pandemic started. So I, there was nothing really, there were no jobs available in conservation, but Maldives was one of the only countries that was hiring at the time because they had relatively low COVID cases and the hotels were reopening. Um, and so I, as I mentioned, I'd got really into scuba diving. So I had Kind of all the qualifications that I needed at that point, so I just applied, and I was very, very lucky to, very lucky, yeah. to get the job. Yeah. Nice. And so you started uh, right when there was the pandemic. I started sort of a year and a half into the pandemic, so sort of late twenty twenty one. Yeah. Okay. I think I think we know now yeah. uh, quite a lot about you. So I think we should get to the beginning of our question. What inspired the development of Rescapers? core preservation program what inspired this whole um business the whole thing yeah. so coral reefs are globally threatened worldwide largely due to ocean human pressures. yeah ocean acidification climate change marine pollution and they've really taken a battering in the last sort of three decades so in the late 90s we the kind of coral reefs around the world experienced what was known as mass bleaching events 
and what happens when corals bleach um, is that they essentially starve. They so white. They become white, yeah. They die so in the outer tissue of the coral, and we'll see this later when it's we do algae. the frame. Yeah, and algae is living inside. And with rising temperatures or other environmental stresses, the algae that lives inside the coral. Which would protect, not really protect you like the nutrients. Yes, it provides nutrients until. for the coral. Yeah. But when it gets um, under pressure from rising temperatures, it will overproduce oxygen, which can become toxic. Mm -hmm. So the coral will expel the algae, but then the corals lose the, the nutrients. So they end up essentially starving or lacking nutrients and right. they can only survive in that state for a fixed period of time. So with prolonged periods of warming, we just see a mass coral mortality. And in the late 90s, that happened in the Maldives. So the Reefscapers project was sort of a response to this problem. It was, we're losing the coral reefs. What can we do to stop that from happening? And right. The idea of building the coral frames was kind of born and what happens that we'll see later, we propagate coral. So we take pieces of coral from existing colonies and essentially duplicate them. We plant them on the frames where they grow into new colonies. And that's how the project started as a response to the, a crisis. And it's grown and grown and grown mm -hmm. and in the last and 20 like years. And like you were saying, there was like pollution many things. And um, I think that um, ocean acidification is a big one. Can yeah. you just quickly tell us more about what that is? Well, ocean acidification is essentially when more carbon ends up in the ocean and it disrupts the pH level. Yeah, it makes it more acid. Makes it more acidic, yeah. And this can be harmful to a wide variety of marine organisms, including coral reefs. Um, coral skeleton is made of calcium carbonate. And as we mentioned, they have the algae living in the outer tissue and this can get disrupted by the ocean acidification. Crush, yeah, it can be really harmful for the skeleton. Um, so the kind of actual structure that the coral lives inside. Um, but there's a, lo a lot of other stresses. Um, urban development is a big problem for corals because it leads to a lot of sedimentation. So a lot of sand or sediment settling on the colonies, which can be a big problem. But really it's it's rising temperatures is the big one. Okay, great. And here we have our other guest for um, today's video, today's interview, uh, Miss Catherine. And you might be wondering guys, why do we need two people to interview at the same time? Why do we need Miss Kate and Miss Catherine at the same time? Well, because actually marine biology and marine preservation is a really complicated job and really complicated topic. That's why a lot of, usually a lot of people work in groups and in teams to actually be able to preserve coral and preserve biodiversity. So let's try to know more about Kathleen. Caitlin. Yeah. And then we can move to more of the coral questions. What about coral preservation? So Miss Kathleen. Yes. What inspired you to get into this? So I knew from a very young age I wanted to study marine biology. Um, my parents always used to take me to the beach and I still remember my very first scuba dive as well. Um, and I just loved, I fell in love with the ocean. I fell in love with marine life as well. Um, so yeah, I knew from a young age I wanted to do marine biology and that when I went, left high school and going to college that I wanted to study study this um, and then I later on figured out that I eventually wanted to specifically go into coral restoration. Right, so it yeah. was since the beginning your passion? Yes, yes. Since the beginning? Yeah. Okay. And like, when did you start and like how did you do this? Because uh, we know that it's your real passion but how, was you how were you able to pursue it? So um, I went to college and um, I studied uh, applied freshwater and marine biology um, for four years. Um, so I did four years, uh, a lot of practical experience as well. Um, and that's where I started to discover that I wanted to specifically do coral restoration. So I studied um, my bachelor's degree back home and that was in Ireland. Um, and yeah, and here, here I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and when did you start doing this? So I've been here specifically working with reefscapers in the Maldives for about 10 months now, roughly about 10 months. Um, so I graduated about a year and a half ago and just trying to find jobs in coral conservation um, and I found this amazing project and um, yeah I've been here about 10 months and it's and it's great so it's the project okay. is really great here I'm really enjoying it. Nice yeah so now that we know more about you Miss Catherine let's ask a question that you volunteered yeah yes let's check it out can you explain the significance of coral reefs in the marine ecosystem. What is so specific about coral reefs? What is also about coral reefs? Why not sea urchins or 
or sand or whatever why coral reefs yeah yeah really good question i mean yeah corals aren't really talked about that much they're very often like overlooked um we don't have them everywhere it's decoration in the world no. yeah exactly and a lot of people see them um when they're washed off on the beach when they're dead or um on jewelry or as decoration so the actual live coral is often overlooked and it's really really beautiful um so it really supports a huge part of the marine life for sure it supports 25% of marine life. Sounds like a very small coral. number. Coral does, yeah, yeah. A um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, sounds like a small number, but it's a huge, huge number. It supports so much marine life. Um, and the food chain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because they help. It, no yeah. protection for fish, and mm. then without fish, no more commerce. Yeah, no exactly. More food, mm. more. Yeah, no so more. it really keeps the whole um, ecosystem and the food chain. Uh, in line and in balance as oh, well. Without it, we'd start to die. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, um, we'd lose a lot of different fish. Um, like I keep doing this, but it's the level of the ecosystem would just start losing its balance completely without the coral. So it's really, really important um, that we have the coral, that we have the um, coral uh, fish that directly um, rely on the corals, and then all the other levels of fish that rely um, on that uh, balance of the ecosystem. Great, for okay. Sure. Um, yeah. So, really clear explanation, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, to our next question, I guess. <laughs> how do you guys, um, uh, how do reefscapers actually, are able to find the right coral for transplantation? And what is transplantation in the first place? Both very good questions. <laughs> um, so, transplantation is sort of means literally planting somewhere like moving it to somewhere else and planting somewhere something migration something people. else yeah it's sort of like an assisted migration you are physically transplanting it um we also use the word propagation with the corals which you also also do with house plants at home um where you kind of take off one small piece so with the corals we take a branch and we propagate it so we replant it onto the metal braid how we choose the right corals there's a variety of different ways that we do okay. it Firstly, some corals you cannot propagate, um, so they're just out. Um, there are sort of two main groups of corals, very broadly, hard corals and soft corals. And soft corals you can't really propagate onto frames because they only have one point of attachment onto the reef. Whereas a lot of hard corals are attached to the reef through multiple points. Oh, so, like the hard parts that used to attach them like the... Uh, yeah, the sort of way the skeleton... Or... Um, we sort of tie them, but okay. the way that the skeleton sort of grows oh, on hard, hard corals... if it's hard, then you can like find some, like like uh, branches on trees can find something. Yeah. But soft, then they'd just be like soft. You yeah, can't really get essentially. Yeah. Sort of if like my arm is the bar of the frame it and my work. finger is the coral, a hard coral is going to be attached across the whole oh, right, line yeah. of my finger, whereas a soft coral would be just one point. Oh, so it's it's hard, Harder. you can't really attach it's them. more like if I, will, I was going to like... Um, Example, like for example if i would climb a wall yeah but without top yeah it would yeah, be yeah. harder exactly you it don't wouldn't. have more strong points you just have some soft things you're gonna slide off exactly it's just not gonna right. fix on and then within the hard corals some do better than others so not all of the hard corals are suitable for transplantation so some species just do better than others and that's been a bit of trial and error so now we choose the the ones that we know are and gonna where do, do you better. actually where do you take the corals from to bring them to the, like, which corals do you take to bring them where? From what I've heard, you take corals from the south and bring them, uh, like the, the corals which are most suitable for hot temperatures and bring them to the more cold, uh, her ones, like getting hot from global warming. Yeah, so we kind of collect from around the island, so that's what our, our permit allows. Um, we have different methods of collection. The best one, in the sense that the kind of least invasive, is some of the species of fish that we have will physically break the corals because they're trying to find the crabs or the shrimp that are hiding within the colony. Um, and when they break them, they just leave the branches on the floor. So we will go around and pick up all the branches because the branches that are left just in the sand won't survive. They've got nothing to attach onto. So we just pick them up and then so we plant the them. that's the kind of transplantation that you do? Yeah, but we do also manually collect as well. Mm. So we can, if you have a kind of colony like this, we can break off one branch 
that yeah. existing colony will just regrow the branch and we will try to, the to take um, a peaceful place. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And the escapers, um, like you just said, you take some corals which are sometimes like broken from the fish. We sometimes take broken from yeah. the fish. Okay. Yeah. And Reefscapers has also done some relocations where um, I mentioned earlier about urban development. So in the Maldives, there's a sort of land reclamation happening quite a lot right. where new islands are built or existing islands are extended and when this happens they typically will kind of build on top of reefs and so what's happening more and more now is prior to that process starting they're removing the live colonies of coral right. to keep them healthy so reefscapers has been quite involved in some relocations around the Maldives um, and then we're moving therefore full mature colonies as well from from place to place. All right and how has um what do you do when you do transplantation like how what is the maintenance and mm -hmm. what is like how do you actually um build these uh, coral frames yeah so we take the small fragments and we just fasten them onto the frame so, of the coral yeah we take the fragment of the coral like you and see we that rope there, like you yes the yeah coral. so we just oh. fasten them on and, and then you just throw them back into the water yeah we drop it into the water so you've got to make sure they're nice and tight so that there's no m room for sort of algae to grow underneath or they're not going to just fall off um, and then we put it like certain types of algae, yes, but macro algae, so like larger algae, can sometimes grow on top of the coral and smother it. So oh, this yes. can oh, be. Right. It depends on the algae, yeah. Mm, okay. Um, and and, uh, and how is the, how, like how is the coral frame actually gonna help? How does it help? Like oh. how is it gonna is it going to like um how is it gonna reproduce? Like, so you, the corals will grow on the frame, so they'll grow exactly how they would on a reef. So oh, they so create this is a sort of an just, artificial so the, so the um the frame which we're going to be showing later later is actually like a structure that you use it's like a it's like nat it's like the sand that you find naturally under the water that that um keeps the the coral intact yeah it basically oh. it gives a space for corals to grow essentially oh, so it's basically a made structure that you can use yeah, exactly. And then lots of the structures together creates an artificial reef. So this will function exactly the same as a natural reef. So all the fish will come. Also something nice about the frames, obviously they're 3D. Um, they kind of create a an additional space underneath the frame. So underneath like the coral, so fish can hide. Peru. Yeah, exactly. Peru, so one. the fish will sort of hide underneath. Sometimes sharks even go underneath. Mm -hmm. um, so they use the whole Thing. They use the corals yeah. themselves, but they use the space underneath as well. Right. What educational experience do the guests which come here um, see you guys, the reef scapers, um, what educational experience do they have when they're building their own coral frames? What experience do they have when they're actually putting the coral on it? Yeah, so anyone who sponsors a coral frame with us and gets to come and build the frame themselves, just like what you guys are going to see today, um, and yeah, they're going to be learning a lot. So they will be working with the marine biologist on site, um, whether that be myself or Kate, my colleague. Um, and yeah, we will attach the corals onto the frame. We will explain what kind of species we have on the frame. A lot of people have a lot of questions about that. Yeah. Uh, the color of the coral, uh, we try point out the different parts of the coral to show them where the actual living part of the coral is. Um, we have guests that are very, very curious or um, don't know a lot or have a large experience with coral, one or the other, and they have a lot of questions and they will learn a lot about the species specifically that we're going to be attaching onto the frame. And they're very curious as well about how we will outplant the frame as well. So we can talk them through that, how the coral is going to grow, how the coral is going to attach onto the frame. So they're going to get the whole essentially walkthrough of um, their coral frame that they're sponsoring okay. on the day. So how does how do you ensure the sustainability of corn harvesting around here and why corn harvesting in the first place yeah good question coral harvesting refers to when we collect the corals so um the process that i kind of mentioned before of either fragmenting existing colonies or collecting the... so it's a part of transplantation yes it's the kind of pre-transplantation it's sort okay. of what how you get the corals to transplant and how are you careful that you don't destroy any other corals around the area yeah so this is something we have to be really careful about because we don't want to overly propagate one colony um when you remove a branch you are sort of creating a space on that colony where that that, that branch was previously filled so when we are fragmenting to collect we will only take maximum of two branches from one colony but normally just one 
um, and then we'll go and collect from multiple different colonies. We do this for multiple reasons. What if the whole, so what if the whole colony is bleached? Like not bleached, but like, what if more than two fell off? Aren't you going to take those? Um, if, yeah, if they've been already removed by the triggerfish, then we'll take all of them. If it's us, though, doing the removal, then we will only take one or two. So you're only taking what is needed to take? Yeah, yeah. so this okay. is sort of to, when, because when we remove them ourselves, we create that opening. And if right. you create a large opening on the coralie, where you take like five or six fragments, mm -hmm. let's say, you're creating a vulnerability for that colony because you've created this space that the fish can now use to kind of go in and attack. So we, and they can then break it more or predators can come. So you've created a vulnerability. So we keep it to one or two and we collect from so that doesn't, the bottom it, it or the edge. So it can still survive without you and you don't make it. Exactly. It okay. can just regrow that branch without being vulnerable to other impacts. Great. Obviously the most sustainable thing is to collect the fragments that have already been broken from the trigger fish. So that's Sometimes always the priority, but okay. it's not always available. Okay. We also then collect from multiple colonies because this increases the genetics of the frame because each colony have, will have different genetics and we the, we just propagated all from one colony, then every colony on that new frame is going to be genetically identical. Okay, great. So we want to make sure that we collect from multiple colonies to increase, to make sure that each frame has different genetics yeah. and that helps improve the sustainability of the harvest. So Caitlin, can you explain to us how this program of um, reefscapers um, does and how do your, does your team do to ensure sustainability and uh, yeah in biodiversity biodiversity yeah. and what is biodiversity so a little bit like what we said earlier as well so corals really contribute to a huge amount of um the ecosystem a lot, like um, a lot of species a lot of species yeah. yeah so like we said earlier 25 percent of marine life and within this there's about four thousand species of fish covered in that so that really rely on corals for habitat, uh, for feeding grounds, for nursery sites. Um, so loads and loads of different reasons um, as to why they would uh, need corals and why we need corals as well. Because of coral reefs, there's a lot of biodiversity attracted to the corals and where we have corals. You will see when you go into the water where there's coral, there's fish and where there's no coral, there's no fish. Um, so it really, really attracts a lot of uh, biodiversity. Uh, to the reef, which is really, really important, a healthy, healthy reef with happy fish. Um, so this is really, really important. Okay. So yeah, and by different biodiversity is like the 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 like how diverse and how many like there are a lot of species of fish, right? Yeah, say, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So for with the biodiversity, we want like a huge, diverse um, amount of marine life, essentially with the corals, and we have noticed that since we planted the corals just out here that um, we've had new species of fish coming um, since we planted them, Definitely which is really great. great. Yeah, for sure, which is really great that... And uh, so what I... does it protect the fish of? So it can protect the fish from like predators. Sometimes we see fish like swimming in underneath our coral frames um, for protection. Um, sometimes we have some fish that are a little bit of a slow swimmer and they like to sit in underneath the coral frames. Uh, so they use that as a habitat um, and as a safety net as well. Um, and also as nursery grounds um, so that they can have their young and we have corals spawning as well in these areas. Um, so yeah, really, really important for our, for our marine life. How did the community of Reefscaper positively, positively impact mm -hmm. the island of Sulahu here in um, Malti? So Fuladu is the island where the physical structure of the frames is built. So Reefscapers have a manufacturing And site. this is what is based? Yes, yeah. So we have a manufacturing site there where the actual frames are built. And there's a team of guys working on the island there who are employed by reefscapers to build the frames. The frames are made of steel rebar and then they get coated in resin and sand. So they've got a few millimeters of sand on them to give it kind of a natural substrate for the coral. And these are all built on Fulodu. And then from our outposted teams like us, we order them from there and they send them here. So in terms of the impact on Fuladu, it's created some jobs, um, it's had this manufacturing plant set up there. And are there like any um, any uh, habits that people have built on the island? I think there are also frames around Fuladu in the water as well. So some frames have been propagated around, so hopefully it has also created a kind of a bit of a reef ecosystem there mm. as well. Oh okay. good, great. Next question, K1, what's your name is Kate? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, what kind of 
like what kind of scientific measurement do you use to maybe conserve and protect coral reefs? Yeah, great question. So we have a few different research projects that we're working on at the moment. The main one is into coral reproduction. So corals can sexually reproduce through spawning, where they spawn. So they release their eggs and sperm into the water, which will fertilize to create larvae, which will settle back on the reef. And this is really, really important for genetic diversity. And that's gonna reproduce? Yes, exactly. Okay, so it's like gonna the create more coral. Exactly, yeah. Egg, larvae, Exactly, exactly. Um, so it's an animal, it's not really an object or decoration. No, I mean, it it's is an animal, yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. So we've been studying that in the Maldives for three years um, and we actually published a paper last year which was the first publication from the Maldives yeah. documenting coral spawning. So that's the main research project we've been looking at and this is really helpful for restoration because understanding the connectivity of the reefs um, which is aided by spawning um, is really valuable for us to understand where corals kind of are, where they're moving to and help to manage restoration projects like ours. We also monitor bleaching, so we have long-term monitoring okay. projects into coral bleaching. We've also done diversity assessments to look at the diversity of the reef. I know Caitlin's been talking about how much marine life the coral reef supports, so we are always checking to make sure that the reefs that we're building and that we're helping to restore are also supporting marine life. So we've done diversity assessments as well, um, but definitely our biggest project has been into um, the coral reproduction. Right, and that of course uh, helps in the protection because if you have more, then you can protect more. Exactly. And if you protect yeah. more, it's like you have a boost, and then it's like you have a boost of coral. Yeah, like exactly. Boost, and then input, yeah. protect it, and then it's like if you were like um, like uh, jumping in sand, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like jumping in long sand, you jump, but then if you lose your balance, it's on the ground. But if you like stick your feet on it your move yeah it's like you get you get more fish i mean more coral you go further mm -hmm. and then you protect them and you stay and yeah. until we get to the point of where we uh were able to have a pretty good chance again to, against hunting exactly and mm -hmm. the corals reproducing themselves is vital because it increases genetic diversity which should increase resilience which hopefully will make them more resilient to climate change Great. as well okay so please <laughs> uh, so, in what ways does the program help corals to adapt to higher seawater temperatures? Because we know now global warming and uh, ocean acidification is really um, killing these corals in the skeleton. So, mm. now that um, I remember I read a documentary where actually, if the if global warming makes the seas like makes the world uh, go two degrees higher, it will maybe kill like ninety percent of the coral population population or 99 percent something like that i think yeah for sure yeah. like one or two degrees doesn't sound like a lot but this is a huge huge change in water temperature or even the like world the was made for, like this is for a reason yeah for sure and this is a huge change even just going off by 0.5 like half of a degree is gonna can really affect the corals so what we're actually doing to um our reaction reefscapers reaction to uh, water temperatures rising at the minute is that we're actually moving our coral frames a bit deeper. So we've started a restoration site that's now 10 meters deep. Uh, this is at a boat wreck. We have a boat wreck back here and we have uh, nearly 20 plus frames here now at the minute. Good. We've checked on them already. The coral's doing really well. So what we're hoping with this is that by putting them 10 meters, you know, the deeper the water, the cooler the water. So the water is going to be a bit cooler down there. And then um, that's going to, of course, help. But if yeah. it gets too cool, isn't it? Isn't it gonna cool? If it gets too cool, because it has to like I have the right one. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not too cold that it's going to affect the corals for mm. sure, because like but I said, guess you do want cold because then uh, if you move them to a temperature which, which is good now, then yeah. the temperature will be rising. I think it's a few degrees, like you said, zero point five degrees can really change a lot. Yeah. So it's like when you have shoes, you don't want to buy the ones for your age. You want to buy maybe one or two years after, but you don't want to buy it right in next, like in a few months. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the same thing. We want to have it like is uh, like in the cold temperature. So then not need to uh, not need to worry about it dying from it, the the warming up of the yeah. Yeah, for sure. And we're propagating this coral from like really healthy coral that has survived bleaching. So it's going to be really mm. resilient. We think uh, yeah. to the to the temperature. So you basically take like these uh, bleached out corals and all these corals. Yeah. Uh, to then be able to um, put them in the water bag. Mm -hmm. And so then, so that um, they will be able to reproduce, reproduce yep. other corals to make 
more than Celine. Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's it. So that's so, what we're hoping. As you know, guys, in this world, there are not enough women scientists. We've only interviewed a few, and these are. This is really a great thing because we've interviewed a lot of men, uh, men scientists, but we need more women. So, what is your message, girls, to the audience watching and to all the women girls in the world who needs representation for the women? I think the most important thing to always have and hold on to is your passion. Find whatever you are passionate about and follow that through because that will always keep you going even when things get really difficult. And it is difficult. It's difficult being a woman scientist. It's difficult being a scientist facing all the threats that we've talked about today. But it is really important, as you said, representation is really important, but just anyone. And so holding on to the passion that you have is really, really key because that will keep you motivated even when it seems that all else won't. And if you do something you love, you'll always enjoy it. I mean, there'll be good days and bad days, of course, but you'll always, you'll always want to do it and you'll succeed so much if you've got passion behind you. So find your passion and run with it. And if Miss Lynn? Yeah, for sure. Just like what Kate said, your passion, your drive, your enthusiasm. Uh, enthusiasm is a big one as well. Like this industry is really going to want people like that. Um, for sure and you just have to go with it and um, there's going to be a lot of people along the way that might question your knowledge your abilities but you just have to stick with what you know you know you're you're here you're capable of it and you just have to stick with your gut feeling and just ignore the background noise of anyone who questions if you're even capable of being in science and you absolutely 100% yeah. can be for sure i mean we hear it there we hear it there we hear it everywhere that you should just follow your passion yeah absolutely it's true, it's true. yeah Something yeah. I'd like to just add to that for girls specifically, stand up for yourself and stand up for each other. If there's a woman in the room and she's making a good point, amplify it for her. Stand up for each other because we will be each other's biggest allies. And to the boys, exactly like you said, the boys hyping up the girls, that's what we need to see more yeah. of. Okay. And uh, for you two girls, one uh, mark here. Oh, uh, so we're two gonna appreciation uh, we forgot that one in the room but yeah. we'll get that later <laughs> so who wants to have uh, the first one oh you can uh, have it oh, okay, here <laughs> we go. oh thank you for thank Ms. you so much yeah uh tokens of appreciation uh for thank today thank you thank you so much guys and the next uh, one is coming for you thank you yeah. <laughs> yeah okay great so this is your coral frame yep it's made as i mentioned of steel rebar and then it's been coated in resin and sand so it's a more natural substrate for the coral. It also helps prevent rusting. Mm -hmm, because it's an animal, like you said. It's, it's exactly. an animal, right? Yeah. And it needs something firm that it can attach onto. Mm. Um, it helps prevent rusting. It also looks a little bit nicer. So I will show you how we do the attachment and then we can, the three of us, build it together. So Great. what you want to do is you want to take your piece of coral and you want to lie it, as I mentioned before, flat along the frame. So you want as much contact between the fragment and the frame as possible. And then you and that's want a hard to, coral, right? This is a hard coral, yeah. Okay. You want to take your tie and you want to wrap it around just one branch. So you don't want to wrap around multiple branches, okay. just around one like around singular between? branch. Like okay. Yeah, so anywhere where okay. you can get it like this. And then you can either hold with your fingers and push with your thumb or just do a kind of back and forth motion. But you want to always make sure that the fasten is on the underside and that the coral is on top. Yep. So I just take any coral? Take any coral and have a go. And then once they're all nice and tight, I will chop off the ends. Okay, so we'll just take, I'll place it um, here, I guess. Yep, that's um, perfect. So where there's more, that, well, there's two on this level. Yeah. So I would just move it along a little bit like this, because then you can put another one here. Yeah. So everywhere where you've got a tie would okay. be one coral. I just, uh, oh shoot. So yeah, maybe yeah. hold this still yeah. with one hand and then... See. Yeah. So I just want to pull it. Yeah. So I'm going to pull back on. Yep. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. just... Yeah, kind of yeah, and then... Yeah, perfect. There. Yeah, nice. And it's stuck. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so it's good? Yeah. So maybe see if you can get it a little bit tighter. I have to get it right there. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So I just need to get more? Yeah, exactly. You've got a D41. See. Okay. Y
So we will go and tighten them all as we go around to make sure they're all on nice and tight. So don't worry too much if you're not sure if it's tight enough. Now I'm going to preempt a question that you're bound to get from a viewer, <laughs> which is why are we using plastic cable ties to fasten coral? Mm -hmm. We get a lot of questions about this. So the kind of worst thing about plastic in terms of plastic pollution is its durability and strength. But that's also the best thing about plastic. That's why plastic took over the world in the way that it did. When it comes to attaching corals to the frame, plastic is the material we've had the most success with in getting them nice and tight. We have experimented with lots of other materials, but we've that has resulted in higher mortality of the corals. So that's obviously our priority is making sure as many corals as possible survive. But we are always trying new things. So whenever a new biodegradable option comes on the market, we test it out. So far, we haven't found success with anything else to the level that we're happy with. You know, for us, the main thing is the coral fragment survive. What will happen is the corals will grow over the tie and it will just form part of their skeleton. So it doesn't harm them. It doesn't get into their uh, digestive system or anything. It will just be in their skeleton. They'll grow over it. What about the fish that from uh, Arctic and uh, it's going to be from full food on the plastic? Well, it's stuck onto the frame. So it's not what really if possible for away? them. What if they, it's, away? they won't be able to because it's too strong. Um, I'll just pop that yeah. around there. Can you try to hold it? Yeah. Um. Okay. Yeah, so that's why we use plastic. We will, as I mentioned, if we find something more um, kind of sustainably produced that is less wasteful but has the same level of success, then we will make a swap. Uh, yeah, the way you had it was supposed to go down. Yeah, you can pop that down. Oh, okay. Yeah, the way that was good. Um, um, that? I would loop it over the top yeah. right here. Yeah. I haven't been able to do the back and forth motion. <laughs> yeah, it's different people find different things easier. It just really depends. How am I able to pull this a little bit? Okay, guys, and now this is our last coral that we need to put on our coral frame mm -hmm. um, with the help of Kathy and Kate. K1 and K2. Yeah, so we're just gonna hold it. Tighten it up. We'll just zip that. Just um, push them on the side, yeah. 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 And Perfect. Cut it. Yeah. Should I do it or? Yeah, go for yeah. it. Now we want to cut the zip tie up. I was just need to unlock it. It's okay. Let's open it. Um, oh, let's cut it. And. <laughs> Done. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Now we can show this into the water. Yeah, so, hold on. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's pop it down. Just be careful of your own guys. You have a three? Two? One? Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> three. Well, we three. do it on three, so. One. One. At our coal frame, right down here.